Hi everyone. Okay, I see some people are figuring out the Q and A. That's great. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, welcome. Thank you for being with us here tonight. And I'm going to get myself sorted out. If you've watched before, you know this is the frantic dash where Elizabeth tries to figure out how to work her computer. Oh my goodness. Okay. <laughs> Thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Um, the Mississauga uh, museums are so thrilled to be presenting uh, our special guest, Matthew Wilkinson. And we're gonna share more with you on Matthew in just a moment. My name's Elizabeth Underhill. I'm supervisor at the museums of Mississauga and I'll be your host tonight. And I am joined by my colleague, Megan Wiles, who's our exhibition coordinator and she is going to be moderating the Q&A this evening. Um, before we uh, introduce Matthew Wilkinson, um, a little bit of background on his presentation tonight. Um, Matthew will be speaking about Our Boys, which is an exhibition that he was instrumental in developing to commemorate the centennial of the outbreak of the First World War in 2014. Heritage Mississauga recorded and researched the young men from historic Mississauga who enlisted for war, served their country, and paid the ultimate sacrifice for the rights and freedoms we benefit from today. These soldiers are remembered on Heritage Mississauga's virtual war memorial and presented in the exhibition, Our Boys, Mississauga's Fallen Soldiers, 1914 to 1918, presented in partnership by the Museums of Mississauga, Heritage Mississauga, the Peel Art Gallery Museum and Archives, and the Museum and Archives Polish Armed Forces in memory of Bolslav Orlinski. This research is ongoing, but to date, under Matthew's leadership, Heritage Mississauga has recorded 96 known fallen soldiers many of whom are honored on local cenotaphs, memorials, and honor rolls. Tonight, Matthew will share some of this research on historic Mississauga's connections to the First World War, both overseas and on the home front. And he will share stories about the fallen, about the fallen soldiers from our community. Um, before we introduce Matthew, two more items of business. Uh, first, uh, we would like to acknowledge that the land on which we work and create is the traditional territory and treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and the traditional homeland of the Huron-Wendat, Anishinaabe, and Haudenosaunee First Nations. We acknowledge the many First Nations, Inuit, Métis, and global Indigenous peoples who call this region home today. And we acknowledge all of the past, present, and future caretakers of this land. We acknowledge that these words only hold meaning if they are followed by thoughtful action and a commitment to listening and learning. And our second order of business tonight, we have a little housekeeping presentation to share with you just to help you uh, get familiar with the the WebEx interface. So let me open this up for you. And I hope this will help orient you. So if you are joining us from your home computer, uh, likely when we're sharing a presentation, it will look something like this on your screen. So you'll see the PowerPoint in this main window and the talking heads up here on top. Uh, it may look different on your computer, but this is a general idea. So there we should be. As I mentioned, Q&A is encouraged. We will be saving about 10 to 15 minutes after Matthew's presentation um, for you to um, ask questions and he will answer them. We'll try to get to as many as we can. So please do pop those questions into the Q&A. And Megan is going to be looking out for those and replying to you when she gets questions. So please do participate that way. If you happen to close your Q&A box, you should be able to reopen it by clicking on this little icon here. And if there's an issue with your audio, you know, sometimes you'll put on your headphones and then you can't hear us. Um, 
there is the option to switch your audio settings. So you just have to look for these three little dots down here beside the red X. And you can go in and switch your audio settings there. Right there. <laughs> And uh, if you would like to change the way the setup looks on your screen at home, you can do that as well. You can choose uh, who you'd like to have on your monitor. So you just have to go into this icon at the top and click on that and it will change the way the screen looks for you. Okay, great. So I think now, Megan, can I hand this over to you to introduce Mr. Wilkinson? Absolutely. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, this talk is presented by the Museums of Mississauga in conjunction with War Flowers, an immersive multisensory exhibition that focuses on the stories of 10 Canadians in the First World War. War Flowers is temporarily closed due to Peel Region's lockdown status, but we will be sharing a virtual tour of the exhibition on our website, uh, which is mississaugaculture.ca. Matthew's talk provides a closer look at the stories and images that are on display in the exhibition, Our Boys, that reflects on soldiers from Mississauga who lost their lives in the First World War. So while in-person visits to this exhibition are also temporarily postponed, we do hope that you'll come visit us once it's safe for us to reopen. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker. Uh, Mr. Matthew Wilkinson. Uh, he's been the historian at Heritage Mississauga since 2004 and has been with Heritage Mississauga as a member of staff since 2001. Um, almost 20 years, Matthew. <laughs> uh, he graduated from the University of Toronto, Mississauga with a special focus on Ontario and Canadian history and historical and rural geography. He's a seventh generation born and raised Mississauga resident. He has an extensive background in local history and heritage research. And in addition to his work with Heritage Mississauga, he's a citizen representative with the city of Mississauga's Heritage Advisory Committee and a supporter of several local historical societies. Matthew and his wife live in Mississauga with their two children. So welcome, Matthew. Uh, would you like to queue up your slideshow now? Very good. Is it working? No. Okay. Well, thank you so much for uh, the the more than needed uh, introduction. Um, and just compliments to the museums in Mississauga. It's one thing to take uh, you know research and and paper and image on files and turn it into something incredibly beautiful and and uh, and strikingly. A strong message for remembrance. And so kudos, Megan, to you and uh, previous to Stephanie uh, for the work that you've done in, in turning this into a, a visual exhibit. And it's just beautifully done. Um, and uh, thank you also. Uh, I, I, think I'm, I, I think I'm the last one on the, on the presentation list here associated with our boys and more flowers. But, you know, I talk about following in the footsteps of giants. Uh, I, I have to uh, have a call out to if anyone hasn't seen them yet. Uh, when they're posted, uh, the presentations that are pri previous to mine, but notably the Aaron Webinga on uh, veterans of uh, of uh, the Song of the Credit River uh, and on uh, the exceptional talk by Party Singh Nagra last week on uh, on seeing uh, uh, Sikh veterans uh, from uh, from Canada and those that served or fell in the First World War. Just uh, incredible presentations and. For for those that are, are joining us, we're obviously talking today about uh, uh, the fallen from this community, and uh, the term "our boys" was was coined uh, by a summer student about uh, in 2013, I believe, uh, for for the the research project behind it. And uh, I do have to give one more shout out. Uh, actually, probably there's a few to, to call out to uh, people like Denise Mahoney and Liz McQuaig who contributed and been part of this process from day one. Uh, exceptionally talented and passionate individual for remembrance in Mississauga, but also to Al Stanton Hagen, who uh, on on her diligent work over two summers, we stand on her uh, on her shoulders. And uh, uh, I've never met uh, someone who was more immersed in a research project, and I still remember her sitting behind me, where she would be searching through records and attestation papers long before half the stuff that's available is now available, uh, needles and haystacks, if you will, and and looking she. 
we got so passionately involved and, and attached to each and every one of the lives uh, that, that we commemorated when we, we started making a list. And it's sometimes you lose yourself in making an academic list of the fall and, uh, and, and realizing in time that these are individual lives. And, and she, she realized that probably earlier than most. And I remember her sitting behind me and uh, jump out, I found one. Damn it. <laughs> and it, it's a little bit of humor that you say that with, but you realize the passion that goes into it because everyone you find, although it's a victory of a research in a sense, you realize it's another life in this community that uh, did not come home. Uh, and so when we look at the, the stories of the and, and our boys, and again, a lot of these images you'll see are in the exhibit. Uh, uh, it is ex extended, hopefully I'm not giving away the secret at the end, but uh, you'll have a chance to go visit it hopefully in, in the new year. Uh, once we, uh, we get past where we're at uh, in these days of COVID, but um, the, uh, the, the the images are, are striking and they're from our community. Uh, they're people that walked on this land. Uh, they may not have known Mississauga by name, but they lived in Lorne Park and Clarkson and Arendale and Meadowvale and Cooksville and every one of them is a story. Um, we, if, if anyone has gone to the many cenotaphs in our community, there are 76 names commemorated in some fashion in our community, whether they be names on a cenotaph or war memorials or honor plaques or commemorative windows and churches and, and uh, uh, old service groups like the Masonic Lodge and Port Credit. They, each one of them commemorated those that did not come home that were affiliated with their, their individual organi organization. Uh, there's no singular list that was created for Mississauga because Mississauga did not exist at the time of the First World War. Um, and, uh, or at least by name and, and as a singular community. And so, again, they didn't know Mississauga by name, but they were from here. Some of their houses still stand. You know, we know the stories of some of the individuals and where they lived, and those streets are still with us today. They walked those, our, our first tour of fall, Private John Leviston lived, lived on Front Street South in Port Credit. How many people have been there? I mean, it, you, 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 you realize this is the land that they lived in, even if they didn't know Mississauga by name. And I think that's a, maybe something strong to remember as we go through uh, through the. When we look at, um, uh, we're gonna we're gonna kind of step back and look at how Mississauga draws its connections to the First World War. And you look at the the outbreak of the war itself, and this might be a review for some, but this just kind of set the stage, if you will, for Mississauga connections. When Great Britain uh, it goes to war in, in August of uh, 1914, Canada is automatically at war. We are dominion of the British Empire. We do not control our own military policy. And so with the, the declaration of war in August of 1914, Canada is automatically at war. And our job as a colony, as, as a dominion, is to provide manpower. That, that's expected of us. So you see a poster like this, which would have been common of the time, speaking to uh, to uh, Loyal to the empire, to the crown and king, and uh, and the like, you have the empire is in need of men, uh, and uh, Australia, Canada, India, and New Zealand answer the call, and that harkens back again to to uh, uh, um, uh, Cardiff Scott last last week, um, and uh, it and it really you realize our kind of our role in this is that raw material, that raw support of the, of, of the British war cause overseas. Arguably, Canada comes to age, it comes of age in the First World War. And we'll talk about that a little bit as we begin to stand on our own two feet in the process of the war. Uh, over the course of the war, 619,000 enlisted men from Canada under the Canadian Expeditionary Force uh, served in the First World War. 60,661 known casualties from uh, from Canada. Uh, approximately one in ten soldiers are not coming home. And that's that's you know, astronomical when you think of just the, the statistics of that. Uh, most of uh, historic Mississauga, from from the the vague references we have, we do not know exactly how many people from historic Mississauga. We're hoping to find out. Uh, we're, we're hoping to have a, a continued research project into this in, in the coming summer to look at records for those that serve. But that's even a bigger he do in haystack kind of search. Uh, but we estimate somewhere around seven hundred to about seven hundred and seventy uh, soldiers, somewhere in that range, uh, would have served from historic Mississauga. Of them, uh, 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 96 known fallen. Although, uh, Megan, I do have a little smirk when I say that. I did my tally on my sheet today. I have my, my list in front of me and I counted 95 names. So I've got to figure that one out. Um, so it's, uh, you know, it, it's an ongoing research project. And so somewhere along the line, line I've, you know, moved somebody out or, 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 or something that didn't fall within the fallen or maybe from this community. And I've got to figure those ones out. So research never completely ends. 
Uh, we also have to look at the time in which the memorials themselves were made, and we'll talk about that toward the end of, uh, of the process of the process of selecting names that go on memorials is not always a fail safe approach. Um, but again, one in 10 fallen on, on what the best and that we know from our community, uh, Port Credit sent more soldiers to the front than any other community in historic Mississauga. As a result, they suffered more casualties. Um, and from the known soldiers that we, we know of that served from Port Credit and those that fell, we can estimate the Port Credit's uh, rate of loss was one in eight. Um, that might evolve in time in our understanding, but it, it, you get a feel that if you weren't affected directly by a loss in the community, you certainly knew somebody who was. We were not that big of a community. And so this uh, the loss of lives in the First World War had a resounding effect on those that lived here in historic Mississauga. Um, again, so we have uh, 96 or perhaps 95 known fallen in historic Mississauga. 78 names listed on Saga Bay cenotaphs and memorials scattered throughout our city. Uh, again, so those are not everyone who fell from this community is remembered in some fashion, and there's reasons for that, and we'll get onto that kind of towards the end. The average age of the fallen is 24 years of age, um, and of the known fallen, we have uh, 76 of them are unmarried, um, and the vast majority of them did not have children. There are a few that did, but we're dealing with the youth of a community. Uh, we're dealing with in a sense, ends of lives, ends of stories, ends of potential families who do not know what their future contributions might have been should they have lived out the rest of their lives in this community. And so you you, you think of, again, the, those you know, stories that come to an end. Uh, you know, there's 76 unmarried young men who went overseas and did not come home. That's potentially 76 young women who did not have a chance to have relationships and have children with those young men. And, and, you know, what, what does that talk about in terms of the evolution of the city and the social dynamics of loss? And uh, it, it's, uh, it begins to be a little bit more hammered home when you start to explore those avenues of social connection. Uh, the, the life and times of, this, of, of those that would be soldiers, I think that's a good phrase to remember. We, we weren't a land of soldiers at the time. Uh, when the war is declared and the Canadian Expeditionary Forces form and they begin recruiting local battalions, you know, there, there were those that served in the local militias. Uh, you know, uh, casually Sunday afternoon groups, that sort of thing. Um, but we were not soldiers by and large. There are a few exceptions to that, but uh, th these are these are uh, young individuals from our community that are seeing recruiting posters, things like these, uh, send more men, uh, more are coming, will you be there, enlist. And, you know, the, if that wasn't enough, you get the newspaper ads. Uh, these are from the Streets of the Review. I mean, it's pretty obvious what the message here is, but the one that I find striking is the 234th Battalion. If you see the questions on the side, three questions for the for the women of Peel County. Question number one, do you realize that one that a, on a word go from you may send another man to fight for your king and country? Number two, when the war is over and someone uh, asks your husband or your son what he did in the Great War, will he hang his head in shame because you would not let him go? Uh, question three, won't you help and send another man to join the army today? The, the, the st story often is that a recruiting sergeant would come through a community looking for 10 to 20 individuals at every stop that he met, every, every stop he made. And he would appeal to courage, he would appeal to patriotism, to bravery, to a sense of adventure. And if that didn't work, they went after the ladies in your lives and tried to guilt you in a service. Uh, the idea was getting your recruits however you possibly could. As the war progressed, we went from exceedingly high numbers of volunteerism towards the end of the war to the beginning of conscription, uh, which has a crisis unto itself. We won't delve, delve into that greatly today, but there were those from this community in 1918 that were conscripted to serve. Many of them did not actually get overseas by the time uh, uh, the war had ended. Some did, um, but uh, conscription did play a role in, in the recruitment process as well. Uh, and so again, you have this, uh, this you know, ongoing process and, if you, if you ever get baffled by battalion numbers and things, that's the battalions were raised sequentially throughout the country. And so if you ever see the, the numbers of the battalion, you'll see that the, four, the first one from this community is, is our members of the 4th Battalion. Well, here we are in, uh, in uh, uh, towards 1916, and they're raising for the 234th Battalion. Um, you know, the, 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 the recruiting process never ended. Uh, it, it debated toward the end of the war and ultimately by the armistice uh, uh, recruitment kind of was on a pause, but uh, nonetheless, the, the recruiting was a constant drive. There was a constant uh, structure here at home looking for soldiers to serve. Sometimes pictures can say a million words. 
Um, these are uh, August of 1914. Again, this is only within two to three weeks of the war being declared. Uh, here you have a recruiting sergeant, the, uh, the, 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 the rather uh, imposing fellow with his hands on his hips there. Uh, he, he's got his men. Um, this is a Port Credit train station. Uh, and what do you see? You see jubilation, you see uh, bravery, you see happiness, you see this, this drive for adventure. Uh, there's not a fear. The, the, uh, the, uh, or if they are, they're hiding it well within the, the, uh, the joyous moments of, you know, you know, politician speeches and the bands playing, the big band music uh, playing, and uh, ladies seeing them off with tea and tarts and, uh, uh, and the like. And the, these, these boys are off on a grand adventure in, in a sense. If, if you look at the, the, the kind of the faces here and the hats in the air and the well-dressed individuals, um, they have no idea. They cannot possibly know the path that's in front of them. Um, this is August of 1914. These boys will not cross into France until the end of February of 1915. Um, they have months of training in front of them. They will become soldiers. They have enlisted, but they are not soldiers yet. Um, and that is a long, arduous, arduous uh, path in front of them. Also, uh, August of 1914, recruits to the Long Branch camp, which is uh, where the uh, essentially where the uh, small arms uh, building is today at the foot of Dixie Road on, on, uh, at Lakeshore. And you look at the faces on here, and, and there's an a, a array of ages uh, of, of social status. You know, you look at the, the two gentlemen in the front with the, the suits and the bowler hats on, and, uh, uh, you know, they look a little bit older, a little bit more seasoned individuals, perhaps married, perhaps with children at home. But then you look at the faces beyond them, and uh, a few of them aren't 16, I'll be surprised. Uh, and so you, you have a, a wide range of, of individuals who are listening up or in, in listening to serve or signing up to serve. Uh, and uh, one of the places they could do that was at the Long Branch Rifle Ranges uh, down in Lakeview. Um, and uh, beginning to kind of see the soldiers, this is a, some of these guys would have been in those first pictures, particularly the Port Credit one. This is soldiers of the 4th Battalion leaving Toronto. They're marching, uh, marching on, uh, on the Front Street uh, to Union Station. Uh, they have they have their uniforms yet. Uh, they have their uniforms now, but they don't have uh, have their weapons or any real training at this point. There's the officer in his shining uniform at the front, followed by a bedraggled soldier who, you know, with the path that's in front of them, uh, they're going to have to get used to the rain. It's a really wet, rainy, cold day. If you see the umbrellas behind them, uh, the bands uh, bands playing them off the music, but it's a it's it's a wet, soggy day, and there they are marching down the street um, and uh, going to be boarding a train at Union Station on their way to Belcarche, Quebec. Um, Belcarche, every uh, soldier, the vast majority of soldiers in the Canadian Expeditionary Force in the First World War will pass through Belcarche, Quebec for training, for mobilization, and for organization, then on to the Halifax, and from Halifax, sending overseas, some of them uh, by way of Newfoundland first, but, uh, but nonetheless, they're going to head uh, overseas. They're going to be reorganized on the Salisbury Plain in London, England, um, most of them do not serve with the units that they enlisted with. Those units uh, at the beginning of the war, the very least, become support units for British units, and they're redeployed as, uh, as with other regiments. Um, but ultimately, they will find their way into France uh, in early 1915. Again, they have a long road in front of them before they will actually be in uh, direct harm's way uh, in, in, in the battlefield of France and Belgium. This is a, a, this one combined with the next picture I find are, are very striking. We have uh, a picture here called the Fort Credit Boys from the Salisbury Plain, 1915. These boys are about to embark overseas. They have not seen action yet. Um, this is uh, likely taken uh, just before they they left left England for uh, for France. Um, the fellow in the uh, second in the top uh, top corner here. This fellow right here. This is Private John Leveston of Port Credit. Uh, he will be the first of our soldiers to fall. Um, he, will, uh, he will be killed in action on April 20, uh, 23rd of 1919. So he's the first of historic Mississaugas uh, 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 soldiers to fall. Not the first to have his name remembered in Mississauga. We have a couple of soldiers whose uh, who date death predate his, but they were not from this community. Their names are added after the fact to uh, the family memorials. Uh, but Private John Leveston lived on Front Street South in Port Credit, um, and uh, he will be the first. He was 20, uh, he was uh, 28 years old, uh, single, uh, worked as a pipe fitter. Uh, but uh, again, uh, first of our, our soldiers to fall. One of the interesting ones, uh, uh, Dorothy Q of the uh, Canadian Room Saga Library had done a little bit of research on this fellow on the far left here. 
Uh, he's the one of uh, the fellow, he's a bugler, uh, George Cardoza. It says Cordoza below, but I believe it's Cardoza. Uh, he was born in Kingston, Jamaica, um, and uh, was not from Port Credit. Uh, actually enlisted in Montreal and through Belcarche and somehow found his way into this picture of all the soldiers from Port Credit. Uh, you will not find him on a, uh, a memorial here because, again, he was not from our community. Um, but he's in this picture and, unfortunately, also lost his life in the process. So there's an individual uh, that uh, Dorothy was able to, uh, to find from uh, Kingston, Jamaica. But again, you look at this picture there, it's prim, it's uh, it's warm, the uniforms are, are straight, it's all at attention. I mean, this is, this is a soldier, these, these boys are showing off their best. Um, you see the very next picture, you juxtapose, juxtapose close the two, uh, Port Credit Boys, Arras, May of 1917. These guys have seen action. Um, the coats are gone, the sleeves are rolled up, and they, a little bit more slouched to their surface, the hats aren't on quite square. Uh, Battle of Arras, May of 1917, there's a good chance many of these boys went through Vimy. Um, May 4th, May 12th, 1917. They would have seen loss. Uh, a few of these individuals, just three faces, we, they appear to be, we don't have names for these ones, but some of them appear very similar to the picture, uh, some of the individuals we saw in the previous picture. Um, and so, you, again, you, you look at these and, and they have become veterans. We've seen that first photograph and this one. We, we, these are our men now on the front line. Um, they, they, have, uh, they have begun to see that picture of war and uh, it's showing on them. Uh, the haggard looks for the picture, I find. Uh, but again, it, it begins to tell the story of the, the faces of veterans as, as they go forward. Again, these are boys from this community. Um, and uh, a, a part of the story, part of that evolution of thought, I and mean, you think also the uh, some of the stories of veterans returning home, of how they seem so much older than when they left. Uh, the time wore on them uh, so, uh, somewhat differently. There's a street school, uh, uh, Good Boy Boys in Street School, July 16th, 1915. Same idea as that earlier picture that we saw from Port Credit and the Port Credit train station. The flags are flying, the band is playing, the politicians, of course, have turned out for speeches. Uh, there's hats in the air and there's a lot of jubilation. Again, they have a long path in front of them. This is now a year after or almost a year after that first group from Port Credit enlisted. Um, the, the, the cost of the war, the, the, the sense of attrition has not really hit home yet. Uh, again, at this point in the war, uh, Mississauga has seen two casualties by the time these boys are enlisting, both from Port Credit. And so it probably hasn't hit that home locally in the street school yet. Uh, the, although we, these are all part of Mississauga today, they were quite separate communities historically. And, uh, and so you, you just, although there would have been some knowledge of loss, of course, the Toronto Star and the Globe and Mail would have been carrying news of, of, of the action overseas. Um, it really hasn't hit home. We still have that sense of jubilation, that sense of joy and pride of, uh, of, of, of service, uh, of, of enlisting to serve and, and doing your duty. Uh, this is the uh, a picture of, uh, from Pama at the soldiers of the Clarkson train station in the spring of 1915. This one has a, a bit of a fun story behind it. Um, the, uh, the, there's a little bit of humor to be found in some of the darker moments in time as well. We should explore those as well. Uh, this is a, a, it, was a, it was a routine for soldiers coming from, uh, from uh, uh, the West, uh, passing through Hamilton and beyond to uh, have an arranged stop at Clarkson for a uh, uh, strawberry tarts and tea by the uh, Clarkson Women's Institute. Uh, and um, so here we have soldiers pausing for a break uh, at, at Clarkson. And uh, whether it was this group of soldiers or another one, we're not entirely sure. But uh, the officers had arranged in advance to have a breakdown of the train. Um, and uh, the story was that they were going to form up their men and march along Lakeshore Road to uh, kind of whip them into shape, if, they, if, if you will. And so whether it was, again, these soldiers or another group, we're not entirely sure. But after their strawberries and tea, the train is broken down and they decide that they're going to march on their way into Toronto. And uh, it was an elaborate ruse by the officers at the time. They had arranged with, uh, with uh, a local school um, to have a little bit of a display for the soldiers. Soldiers are not armed at this point. They have, uh, are, are relatively raw new recruits. And as they marched along, uh, one of the stories is Lakeshore Road, another one says Warm Park Road. We're not entirely sure which road, but they would have been heading towards Port Credit. Um, as they marched across uh, the, the roadway, uh, a bunch of uh, local schoolboys were hiding in the ditches. And as the soldiers passed, they jumped up and pelted them with apples. Uh, and the story of the newspaper that recounts is that after a brief pause, the soldiers returned fire. Um, 
there was an apple fight. <laughs> and so you have these, uh, these, these stories that, that pass down of, you know, trying to, to uh, manage these troops, if you will, and, and kind of get them formed up and, and ready to be soldiers. Um, and the troops, the train was fine. Uh, the troops marched to Port Credit, reboarded the train, and on they went into Toronto. And so, uh, and beyond, of course, they'll be destined again to Belcourt J and, and, and beyond. A local group uh, raised at his own expense, uh, uh, Thomas Laird Kennedy, Colonel Thomas Laird Kennedy, uh, Tom Ken Road, uh, named after uh, after Colonel Kennedy. Uh, Colonel Kennedy was a veteran of the Boer War, uh, an aging officer by the time the First World War runs around. Uh, but uh, he raises a, a group of, uh, of 96 uh, volunteers in Cooksville, known locally as Colonel Kennedy's men. Uh, these individuals, although trained and uh, basically trained uh, at uh, Cooksville Fairgrounds, um, on the south side of Dundas Street here in Ontario, uh, they will be destined to become a bicycle messenger corps. Uh, 96 individuals, and to the best of our knowledge, every one of them came home. Um, but they, again, are not going to be frontline troops. Uh, at least that's not the intent under, under Colonel Kennedy's direction. These men uh, marching their way westward on Dundas Street through Arendale. Uh, the only landmark that is uh, is present today in this picture is that spire away in the distance there. If you can see me from my cursor circling it, that's St. Peter's Anglican Church uh, in, at uh, Dundas and Mississauga, uh, Mississauga Road. Uh, everything else in the foreground of this picture was burned in the fire of 1919. Uh, so this is Dundas Street through Arundel Village, and there is the 96 soldiers or so. Uh, marching through, and uh, by all accounts, they're on their way to Hamilton. That's one heck of a walk, but uh, they are they are marching. Colonel Kennedy will likely be one of these individuals on horseback uh, behind. Uh, same group of individuals this is at Dundas Street and Mississauga Road. Uh, this is the the uh, fence right to the right here are the steps up to St. Peter's Anglican Church, and that's the the other fence is the old driveway up to St. Peter's Anglican Church. That horse and buggy in the distance is on Mississauga Road, just to give you the uh, kind of the, the view here. They've already passed the Credit River, and this other bridge in the distance is over the Salm over Sawmill Creek. So this is right at the intersection of Dundas Street and, uh, and Mississauga Road. Uh, again, spring of 1915. And again, you don't you don't picture our community like this. Like this is you know armed soldiers uh, in in uniform on mass marching through historic Mississauga. It would have been quite the spectacle to see. Uh, and you can see pictures today. It really tells you a different tale of a different time, if you will. Um, Streetsville, uh, Trinity Anglican Church, 1915. Uh, here we have the Streetsville recruits uh, formed up with their reverend outside of Trinity Anglican Church. And uh, again, these boys are, 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 short, are shortly going overseas. Uh, we actually have names for the soldiers in, 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 this, uh, in, this, in, this, in this image. There's a, a striking story of a, of a recruit from, uh, from Streetsville, and um, his name was McCordy. And uh, uh, he was said to uh, gone to enlist and was rejected, and um, he was underage. And uh, the story was he was sitting on the steps outside of the church, uh, crying. And a recruiting sergeant came and sat down beside him and said, "What's the problem, son?" And he said, "I want to do my part. My brothers are enlisted, but I'm not allowed." He says, "How come?" He says, "I'm not old enough." He said, "How old are you?" He said, "I'm 17." He said, "You're 18. Come with me." Uh, and so the the idea was, you know, when there was a will, there was a way. Um, and there's stories of that all over the, the place, not only with Mississauga, but elsewhere of, of those that, were, that kind of sought any way to, to serve and, and to do their part. We have stories of people who were routinely rejected because they worked in agriculture, which was uh, you know, a, a necessary service during the war. Um, but they would try. If they didn't get they would get rejected in Toronto, they go to Hamilton. They get rejected in Hamilton. We have a story of a fellow who went down to Port Dover to enlist. Uh, trying to find his way, uh, and so the, you know, the, you sometimes shake your head at the at the at the drive to, to put yourself in harm's way, but you know, it's a different place and time and a different mentality, perhaps, of the service uh, for those seeking to to serve. And uh, stories like this, again, you think uh, you know, the the life and times of those you see in behind the soldiers here. If you look in the distance, there's a lady with like a, a cap over her head, and this looks like a young boy looking over a over a shoulder here. I mean, you, you, you really think these are lives, these are loved, loved ones left behind, whether they be you know, wife and child or parents or siblings and, and whatnot. And there's, there's stories here. They're not just faces. They're not just names on a wall. Uh, the stories to really remember. Uh, the Long Branch Camp of, of 1916, and there, there are other uh, things we won't talk about today, but we can explore other times. Uh, 
you know, we were home to a rifle range. We were also home to an aerodrome in, in Mississauga, but we won't explore those today. We'll focus on the, the soldiers themselves. But this was an army camp in the First World War right here in Mississauga uh, uh, at the foot of Dixie Road. It's outside of Lakeshore Road, that's Lake Ontario in the background. And you can see the bell tents uh, all set up in the field here. This is where the, the recruits would stay for their training. There's the, there's the parade ground itself uh, in, in front of them. And these barracks are being built. They'll be ready for occupation in the spring of 1917. And that's the rifle range facility here in Mississauga. Uh, you look at the cap badges. We didn't serve under the Maple Leaf flag, but we did serve under a Maple Leaf for the most part. Um, and uh, this is the cap badge that we identify. Our uniforms were essentially interchangeable uh, to the British uniform at the time, but the cap badges that our soldiers wore uh, had the Maple Leaf insignia on them. And these are all uh, battalion numbers, and there were more, but these are all the battalion numbers for those that were recruited locally. Uh, anywhere from the 4th Battalion raised in August and September of, of 1914, all the way up to the 234th, which did not actually get overseas in time for the uh, uh, practical service or, or frontline service before the war ended. The EP EPCLI, the Princess Patricia Committee in Light Infantry, uh, the most soldiers for any single unit that served were under the 126, and consequently they had the most local casualties as well, the P126. Uh, we also have uh, units that are perpetuated today, the Toronto Scottish, which has the armory in Mississauga up on up on uh, Ninth Line, uh, is uh, the 75th Battalion, uh, the Mississauga Horse. Uh, that is our, our, our local boys are connected there. And every one of these units had people that were locally served. Every one of them had casualties from the community. Including uh, Egerton Sayers from Benares uh, family, uh, the Harris family of Benares, serving with the 19th. And there's the badge in the center of the 19th Battalion. And so you have the, these over and over again. They're, they're, these are these are real things. These are, these are, these are badges that meant something. Um, and uh, and for many of them, it was the only need for this that they knew uh, it was the badge they served under. And when you look at the war itself. And in terms of local connections, I mean, these are names that resonate through history. You may not, you don't need to be a military historian to recognize some of these names, particularly like Vimy and Passchendaele and uh, uh, Arras or the Psalm. I mean, these are names that ring down through history, and every one of them had many people from this community that lost their lives. Uh, so when you look at our war dead, they that, that, that lie elsewhere. Uh, that, uh, many with no known graves. Uh, they fell in numerous conflicts in the First World War. Uh, and we connect to almost all of them. Uh, and uh, it tells you something about kind of the breadth of service, but also the community connections there. And every one of them would have been a news home, would have been uh, a letter, a telegram, um, uh, sadly, a, eventually a death penalty in a school and a medal that comes back home to a loved one left at home. Uh, and so it, each one of these is a lot. They're not just statistics, although, again, they could into these frames. Sometimes we forget, uh, we forget ourselves when we think of numbers. Uh, when we look at uh, some of the particular uh, moments within the First World War, we're not going to go through all of them here, but, uh, uh, you know, the absolute atrocious uh, battle of attrition, which uh, over months of fighting and incredible casualty rates on both sides of the conflict to absolutely neg negligible gains. Uh, this, was, this was, again, a, a horrible battle of, tr of attrition, uh, really cemented the fact that this was not going to be a short war. Uh, 24,000 Canadian casualties between July and November of 1916 uh, to the Germans referred to it as the bloodbath of the Somme. And if you read the story of the Somme, it was a, it was a futile battle of the stalemate. Uh, and again, it almost negligible gains with over a million casualties on all sides. Uh, just incredible uh, when, you, when you read those, those numbers. 16 uh, that we know of from Mississauga killed during that, that those months from July to November of 1916. Five alone from Mississauga lost their lives on October 8th. Um, what happened on October 8th? Disastrous raid on Regina Trench by the Allied forces. Uh, with a massive number of casualties on that. Five guys from the start of Mississauga lost their lives that day. Uh, and, and that's the single loss, single largest loss of life, loss of life on a single day um, in, uh, for Mississauga. Uh, fast, uh, fast forward to Vimy, uh, April of 1917. Again, this is a name that rings through in Canadian history and our Canadian identity today. Brigadier General Ross uh, commented in the first few minutes, I witnessed the birth of the nation. Uh, we didn't fight under the, under Canada flag, but we did fight under a flag of our own at the time, and that is the, the Vimy Red Ensign. Uh, in a few years, a few years after Vimy, this will become Canada's first national flag, uh, 1922, the Red Ensign flag, so Parliament. 
Um, uh, April 9th, the 12th, uh, uh, at the beginning of the war, the first few years of the war, Canadians fought as auxiliary to British units. Uh, they remobilized, reorganized at the beginning of 1917 as Canadian units and put under Canadian command for the first time uh, in the course of the war. Uh, they are given during the Arras offense, offensive in the spring of 1917, they are given the objective of Vimy, which was considered really an unachievable target. Um, the French, followed by the British, had tried to dislodge the Germans from the high ground at Vimy previously to horrendous casualties and were ultimately unsuccessful. The Canadians were given this in the spring of 1917 as their objective. Uh, 15,000 Canadians, uh, four divisions under Canadian command attacking together. A butcher's bill was incredible. Uh, again, 15,000 Canadians, 3,598 uh, killed, 7,000 wounded. Approximately, we've documented now 56 soldiers from, uh, from Mississauga that we know of that were at Vimy, seven killed, 11 wounded, one died of wounds uh, a couple of months later. Um, absolutely atrocious, but they achieved the unachievable. The Canadians, Mississauga involved was in that, the Canadians captured the ridge at Vimy, never to surrender it for the rest of the war. That became one of the high points of Canadian involvement. And that is the focal point of Canadian remembrance overseas, which of course is Vimy Memorial. And all 60,661 Canadian names are on, uh, fallen names are on the Vimy Memorial. So it's remembering those that served and fell over with Canada. Passchendaele, another name that rings down through through, uh, through our history, uh, part of a, a larger offensive in the Third Battle of Ypres. Uh, the four Canadian divisions, again, uh, uh, veterans of Vimy at this point, uh, uh, 4,000 Canadians killed, 12,000 wounded, eight from historic Mississauga over over uh, in, uh, October and November. Um, and uh, it was just, Passchendaele is where the atrocious weather that we all read about in the First World War with the rain and the mud and the shell holes and the devastated landscape and the obliterated town, Passchendaele is really where it comes to the front in terms of like, what the conditions are overseas and what these wars are fighting in. Uh, it just, you know, horrendous conditions. There's the stories of uh, mud being so deep that if you stepped off a gangplank, not only would the man disappear, but so would the horses he's riding. Uh, I mean, you, you deal with, with uh, you know, atrocious. Uh, um, physical conditions and the geography of the, of the landscape of just, you know, literally the earth being ripped apart by the, the effects of the war. But when you look at the fallen here, and, and uh, these are again from historic Mississauga, so within the greater context of Canadian contributions to the war, we have individual stories from each of them. The highlighted names here are the pictures that were, were uh, that we should show as part of this. And, you know, just a few of them I've already introduced you to Private John Leveston is on the left there. Uh, Adjutant Lieutenant uh, George Gordon Duncan uh, worked for Consumer Gas uh, for Port Credit. Uh, not only did he himself, but his two brothers, Alan and Wallace, also served, as did their father as a chaplain. Reverend, uh, Reverend Duncan out of Port Credit also served. Uh, and so you had a father and three sons all serving. The sons did not fare well. Um, uh, George and his younger brother, Alan, both were casualties of the First World War. Wallace was injured, lost an eye, and uh, the use of an arm uh, in the First World War. So you have the father comes home as a chaplain, only one of his three sons come home and, and, and he's named. Uh, and so you just, you think of individual families that have, you know, losses and contributions to, to the war and just, you know, no life is any more or less significant than any other. There's some that we know a lot more about than, than others, but they, they all have stories to tell and they're all, they can all, uh, their faces from this community. The list grows longer in 1916. Uh, the, the newspaper column there is so the second name is uh, Lance Corporal Frederick and Anthony Tapp. Uh, you know, the father served, as do all five of the sons. Can you imagine the, the, the mother at home? Uh, if you think of the social dynamics at home and uh, that sense of, of, of loss or impending loss, perhaps. And uh, um, unfortunately, the father is killed, but all five sons do come home uh, from, from the service. But so there's a newspaper column uh, referring to that. And the fellow in the bottom left there, I always kind of shake my head at that. That's uh, Private Edward Cosmo Innes of Cooksville. Um, if that boy is any more than 16 or 17, I, I don't know if I buy it. Uh, his attestation papers say he's 23. I'm sorry. <laughs> there's no way. Uh, his uh, baptism uh, would suggest that he was 17 years of age, uh, and uh, and so you know these are these are young individuals in the community. Each one of them 
again, a, a story left behind. Uh, there's a, a private uh, um, a shaver, Howard Shaver uh, of Port Credit, who uh, his father ran a, um, a general store at the corner of uh, Lorne Park Road and Lakeshore Road, where they, if anyone was down in that neighborhood today, where the gas station is today. A uh, little garage on that corner. That's where the uh, the shaver store was uh, at the time. And so again, the, these stories that they, they really do uh, come home. Some some are some offer no um, uh, no answer to them. Why did uh, Private Joseph uh, uh, Peter Oliver Garbett of Malton serve under an alias? Uh, he served under the name Frederick Graham. Um, it wasn't until he passed that they uncovered the fact that that was not his actual name. That was the name that he enlisted under. He was of age. He didn't have to lie about his age. So what is the story behind someone serving under an alias? If you find his uh, his gravestone today, you will find both names on his on a gravestone. He was buried under the name Frederick Graham, and then the name his given name of uh, of Joseph Peter Oliver Garbett was added afterwards. If you go through his service record, that shows uh, that the, the type name is Frederick Graham, and underneath it's handwritten alias. Uh, and so you know. What's the story there? We don't have an answer to that. Um, uh, he had a family here. His mother was here. His uh, his sister was his next of kin, and the sister would inherit anything that was left of, according to his will. She lived in Brampton, and uh, um, and you have these correspondence with some letters that survived, but nothing to indicate why on earth he enlisted under an assumed name. Um, we don't have any reasoning that we found for that, and and again, some things we just don't have uh, have answers for. 1917, the list grows longer still. Of course, 1917 is when uh, when uh, Vinnie, uh, Vinnie takes place in Passchendaele as well. Uh, Private Dennis Anger, right? he's the fellow on the left down here at the bottom. Uh, I always find him perhaps our most striking picture of a soldier, if, if I can quantify that from uh, from our soldiers. He attended St. Peter's Anglican Church in Arendale um, and uh, was said to have a good singing voice at the time. Um, he, uh, March 1st of 1917, he's considered a casualty of Vinny because the Canadian troops were preparing for their attack, which would be a month away. Uh, he was on an advanced scouting party to, advance, to uh, scout out uh, German uh, trench positions uh, with a commanding officer. That commanding officer who was shot by a sniper, um, and uh, Dennis Anger went to drag him back into, uh, into a trench, and he in turn was shot and killed by the same or another sniper at the time. Uh, he gave his life in trying to defend his officer. The officer did survive, um, but Dennis Anger lost his life. He was the first of our casualties associated with Vinnie Ridge. Um, you have the, some of the other ones here. Thomas Cartwright, Sergeant Thomas Cartwright of Arendale. Um, he was said to be one heck of a sports uh, baseball player. Uh, he was married with children, and he was the first of our casualties, and perhaps the first Canadian casualty at Vinnie Ridge. When the uh, when the bells went off and the soldiers went over the top, uh, Thomas Cartwright was said to be killed within moments of the Canadian advance uh, on, on at Vimy. Um and uh, some of the others uh, at Vimy Ridge: Joseph Clark, William Kidd, Eli Rossiter, James uh, James Howard Fawcett of Streetsville, Jack Young of, of, of Clarkson. These are all individuals who uh, would lose their lives uh, at that moment in time. Uh, one of the ones that I'm struck by the most is uh, Lieutenant uh, William Henry Clipperson, who uh, is the fellow with the mustache in the, uh, in, the, in the corner here, in the bottom here. He's a math teacher from Streetsville. Um, he served as a captain, um, but in, uh, in order, he was furloughed back to England, and in order to go back overseas, he reduced his rank or took a, low, a lesser rank in order to fight again with another unit against the advice of his father. He's written home saying he was going to do this, and the father uh, really implored him not to. Um, and uh, he did. And unfortunately, under that uh, serving as a lieutenant, uh, he lost his life uh, the second time around. Uh, and so, again, you have all these stories that come through these, these individuals, and they, they really are, are, are people that, uh, you know, they, they leave those loved ones behind. Uh, the fellow in the middle here, this is Fletcher Oswald Miller. And uh, and Fletcher, um, uh, he's remembered up on the family gravestone at uh, at uh, Eden Cemetery in Wistar uh, up uh, up in Meadowville. Um, and uh, he lost his life in July of 1917. And um, uh, he worked on a family farm. He was a bookkeeper in Lauren Park, and he worked on the family farm in Meadowville prior to enlisting and uh, loses his life overseas. The only son uh, of. Uh, of uh, Robert and Amelia uh, Fletcher, uh, and he's remembered again on the family gravestone in Eden. And uh, I live right around the corner from that. And uh, every year with my kids after Remembrance Day, we go over and uh, 
uh, place our poppies there. In 18, unfortunately, again, the list gets even longer. Uh, each year, the more the, 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 the attrition count uh, gets higher and higher. And we, we saw it earlier in, in, uh, in the war in 1915. Um, uh, the, uh, the older brother of Alan Duncan, uh, George Duncan, loses his life. Well, here we are at the end of 1918. Alan Barry Duncan, a, a young student from uh, Parkdale Collegiate. This is Alan Barry here in, uh, in the third one in the middle. Uh, and he loses his life over overseas. Um, I, again, uh, one of the three brothers that you know, served uh, two of them and to lay their lives down. Uh, we also have uh, Egerton Sayers, again, of the Benares connection here. He was killed by a sniper uh, in 1918. And uh, uh, again, it, all of them are stories. And uh, if anyone wants to expand on any of these, I mean, uh, contact Elizabeth uh, and, uh, and myself. Uh, we have hundreds of files on all of these individuals most happy to share with them and we've tried our very best to develop biographies for every one of them just to try to remember them. If we don't have a picture, then we still remember them in name. Uh, the brothers in arms, some families, you, just, you, you wonder of, of you know, like, you know, the heartbreak at home. Every loss is, is significant. You imagine being the Whiteheads from Malta, uh, three sons, a uh, family of six. Um, not only the, uh, the George and twin brothers Robert and Arthur all losing their lives in the First World War. Uh, their younger sister is also losing her life in 1919. Um, so this is a family that goes from six to two uh, within a year. Um, and just you know, you think of the horrendous loss uh, you know, in the community. Uh, the Duncan brothers, I already mentioned those, George and Alan, uh, their, their little brother Wallace, uh, kind of injured from the war. Um, and uh, again, you think about the loss within the community, and, and uh, probably no more felt though than that of the Thompson brothers. Um, Alexander and Douglas, uh, the Doug uh, Douglas the Younger was a lieutenant, uh, he lost his life in 1918, the older brother, uh, and he's the one you can see his, uh, his rank insignia on his cuffs uh, in the picture there. He is Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Thomas Thompson, uh, the, the, the father ran Thompson Lumber in Port Credit. Um, Alexander was our highest ranking officer from the start of Mississauga to serve in the First World War and also our highest ranking individual to lose his life. Um, the uh, Streets for Review on his passing wrote that no finer or braver son of steel ever went overseas. Um, and we, we just, you know, what could the individuals have done if they had lived? Uh, those are stories we don't know. Uh, it's the what ifs uh, might have happened. Uh, but these were all. Contributing educated uh, uh, individuals, the, the Thompson and the Duncan certainly were, were, were all educated individuals. Uh, the Whiteheads were, were farmers from up in Malton. One of them was living out in, in Alberta at the time of enlistment. Um, but nonetheless, the, these are all families from this community that, uh, you know, the, those stories come to an end, uh, if you will, in, in, in the First World War. Uh, uh, soldiers coming home from this community. Uh, we may not recognize the visual today, but that's Lakeshore Road at the Credit River. Um, the, you see there's a, what's called a return man's parade. They're building the new bridge over the Credit River, so that's the Bailey Bridge that they're, they're crossing over in that picture there. They are uh, at Port Credit, uh, downtown Port Credit, as we call it today, is in the far distance on the right there, and they are marching westward along Lakeshore Road. That's Front Street in the foreground uh, crossing Lakeshore Road. Uh, these soldiers are being welcomed home, um, and they are destined for a grand uh, held at Harborland Estate. Uh, uh, that's uh, in the background there is uh, what is now Brookner Rhododendron Gardens, Lake Ontario behind that in the distance, and the Harborland Estate known as Eden House is still there today, a private home today, um, and uh, it's August 4th of 1919, and uh, this is a, uh, a garden party, a wrap-up party, if you will. The soldiers will be welcoming the Honorable Arthur Meehan, who will later become our Prime Minister, who will officially demobilize the soldiers in Peel County from the service. Uh, so these soldiers are coming home and they're ceasing to be soldiers. Uh, as of uh, veterans all, but, but uh, soldiers no more uh, come, come August 4th of 1919. Um, this year, uh, I've always, you know, we've talked about this picture many years and, and thought about it in terms of the activities. There was, there, was, there was games to be played. There was something called the Slippery Pig. We're not really sure what that was about. But uh, the, uh, there, there, there was festivities. There was lawn bowling. There was pie eating contests and so on. But this was, this was a party. This was a, there were speeches and dignitaries and the like. But 
Um, uh, this is also in the onset of the really the first impact of the Spanish flu. Uh, and so you think of, you know, we're living in a time of quarantine and or lockdown or whatever we want to call it today of social distancing and masks and that sort of thing. That's in front of these guys. They, 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 it's, it's not it's not the forefront yet. Although the Spanish flu has been around for a little bit, uh, come August of 1919, you know, it's going to come back in the fall of 1919, um, and you know it's going to hit home. There's going to be loss of life. There's already been loss of life. The fall of 1918 with the first wave of closures and, and whatnot. But uh, here's the soldiers coming home, uh, and and potentially what that brings with them. We don't have direct references, but again. It does come back in the fall of 1919, and, and you wonder if things like this, because this is going to be repeated elsewhere. That's not just here. This is, you know, any city welcoming those soldiers home. Uh, we always think of November 11th, uh, 1918, at the end of the First World War. Uh, November 11th was the armistice. It was a ceasefire. The war didn't end until June, June 28th of 1919 with the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, and so the, the actual end of the war is the peace treaty that was signed in 1919. And that's the return of the soldiers following that peace treaty. So uh, these are the soldiers again coming home in August of 1919. Spanish flu, speaking of which, um, two casualties from our military in the First World War, one of which October 28th of 1918, um, uh, really in that, that deadly second wave that went through uh, Canada in the Spanish flu, and that's uh, the son of the St. Lawrence Starks Company of William Gray. This is Lieutenant Angus Douglas Gray, um, uh, who dies here at home, as does uh, Street Skills Hubert McCordy, um, and he passed away in June of 1920, also from the Spanish flu. And so you, you, you realize just even the dates of the passing, that this thing, although you know, we read little bits and pieces of it, it kept coming back. There were, there were kind of moments and spikes for each of them, not really knowing how to contain it. We know a lot more today about health regulations and whatnot, not to draw direct comparisons and whatnot, but the Spanish flu was amongst us a uh, hundred years ago for a long time. Um, and, you know, it claimed individuals, and here's two of our soldiers that served in the First World War, only to fall victims of it in the, in the months that followed. Just remembering kind of those, uh, one of the amazing things you have on display there at, uh, at, at our boys at the museum are the, the medals uh, and, and the uh, memorial scroll and plaque for the dead man's penny. Um, seeing these things and what would have come home with the soldiers to, or what would have come home to the families following the, the, the death of the soldier, uh, the different medals and what they meant. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, I was struck and I'm still shaking my head at it where uh, last week, uh, um, uh, Party uh, uh, mentioned that uh, some of the medals were found that people were reselling them, that they were taking the names off of them. Uh, and just, you know, you, you take your head at stuff like that, where you're just like, you know, this needs, needs meant something and they mean something and they belong to, to an individual and they shouldn't erase those stories. And so I, I just think they're exceptional that you have those on display there and people can see kind of what. But they would have been cherished by the families of those left behind. They're not just things in a box. They, they meant something, and, they, and again, they mean something today. Um, cenotaphs and memorials, I think these are, are fascinating ways to look at our landscape today. And Mississauga does not have a single cenotaph. We have seven. Um, we don't have a single memorial. We have dozens and dozens of memorials. Um, most of them connect to something that is older than the city itself, whether they be uh, places like Port Credit and Streetsville that built their own cenotaphs prior to amalgamation, Malton, which erected a cenotaph after amalgamation. Um, you also have places like uh, in the Spring Creek Cemetery and uh, uh, St. John's Anderson Cemetery in Dixie that erected cenotaphs later uh, for, for those community calling for observances and, and services and the like. Um, but uh, when you look at the, the cenotaphs and, and, and war memorials that were, were created after the war, uh, there was kind of some strict guidelines and suggestions uh, for how to commemorate um, a, a design book by Reginald Blomfield uh, and came up with some accepted designs. One of the most famous one and most common one is known as the, um, uh, as the uh, uh, what is it, the Cross of Remembrance. I've got the name here before I lose again. Cross of Sacrifice. We'll talk about that in a moment. I had to remember the name. Cross of Sacrifice. Uh, Rudyard Kipling, a name that we probably all know from our old English studies. Uh, he was the, the literary advisor and he came up with uh, four slogans for remembrance. And we would use these interchangeably on war memorials and remembrance services. And these again date back to 1919. 
the glorious dead, we will remember them, lest we forget, and their name will live forevermore. Um, we use lest we forget a lot uh, during remembrance in this time of year, of course. Um, Mississauga, for whatever reason, in their first war memorial, they use the term, we will remember them. Uh, and you will still find that memorial phrase used uh, on, on many of the Mississauga monuments and tells. And these were again recommended at the time. Um, there was no right or wrong way to do a memorial in terms there was more of a guideline saying that designs were to be noble, uplifting, classical, monolithic, yet tragic and enduringly sad. Uh, they were to be built of permanent materials, whether they be concrete, brick, or stone, something that would not deteriorate in time. They were to be vertical. Um, they were in their sight lines were to unite heaven and earth. That was the idea behind a cenotaph. Um, cenotaph, of course, we all know the references meaning empty tomb, um, uh, places for remembrance. Another story is where do you place cenotaphs in the community? Um, this is the Port Credit Village Square, uh, where the Port Credit Banshell was uh, on, on uh, State Bank Road, north of Lakeshore Road. This is where the cenotaph is today in Port Credit. Um, and there's a reason why the cenotaph ended here, ended up here. Um, the, during the First World War, the soldiers were sent off with the politicians' speeches and the music and everything from the town square. The, 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 the train station was literally just five minutes up the road from, from, uh, from where the, this was. Um, and during the course of the war, notices of the dead were posted on the van shell. It was the public gathering place. It was, uh, so this place of music, this place of, of, of joy prior to the war becomes a place of sadness, uh, rather organically, if you will. Um, and so when it comes to creating a war memorial, uh, it, the site is chosen as an obvious one. And the, and the band shell is moved. The band shell is taken down to, to uh, park down on Lake, uh, Lake Ontario. It didn't last very long down there. Um, but the, the site of the band shell on State Bank Road became the site of the Port Credit Cenotaph uh, in, in 1925. Uh, so the Port Credit Cenotaph, uh, it was unveiled November 9th, 1925, officially known as the Port Credit and Vicinity Soldiers Memorial. Um, uh, uh, money was raised locally for, for the creation of the Cenotaph. Uh, a, a, company, a granite company from Toronto was selected to build it. Um, and uh, it followed the strict design of Blomfield's uh, Cross of Sacrifice, uh, outlined in the memorial book. And in 2017, the unnamed park that was around the cenotaph was christened in Jimmy Park, and a, and a hat set there to Denise Mahoney uh, from the city of Mississauga for leaving the charge on the name of Jimmy Park. And so we have the, uh, the, the Port Credit and, and the City Soldiers Memorial, Port Credit War Memorial, uh, located in Jimmy Park on State Bank Road. Commemorating the soldiers. Uh, again, these are not all Mississauga. This is Port Credit in the vicinity. So it's kind of the soldier from, say, south of Dundas Street, uh, more or less, uh, uh, named on, this, uh, on the cenotaph. Uh, the names from the Second World War and the Korean War would be added to the cenotaph later. Um, the naming, uh, names on cenotaphs are a bit of a challenge, too. There is, uh, there is no real naming convention in a way that came down to memory. Um, and so you have names that didn't make, make it on the list and you had other names that weren't from this community that made it on the list. Uh, and because these were created in the years that followed, in some cases, family moved. Uh, and uh, street, same idea a year later or less than a year later on July 1st, 1926, Maple Street, so a great, over, a great war overseas veterans memorial, the Street Bowl Senate Path. Uh, Paths and memorials throughout our city, including the Civic Memorial, which was created in 2011. We had an older memorial, if anyone remembers the old fountain uh, along Burnham Road at, at, at the Civic Center was a previous memorial to that. With the redesign of Civic Square, remember that uh, the fountain was, was, uh, was demolished, but uh, replaced by the uh, the Civic Memorial. Uh, places, uh, the memorial plaques, honor rules, veteran sections of cemeteries, uh, schools, uh, benches, windows, uh, all manner of ways in which things are remembered. It's only a scattering of some of the ways that service and, and loss are commemorative within our community. Names tell it all, or faces tell it all. I mean, these are our boys. These are our, our, our individual lives and stories. We don't have pictures for all 96 uh, soldiers. Uh, we have about 40 some odd pictures. Some of them are really bad resolutions. Megan, you did an amazing job uh, kind of creating those, but some of them are literally little snippets from newspapers. That's, that's all we found. Um, uh, some of them, there's a story to be told. Uh, I like the fellow in the uh, second one from the bottom left. If you look carefully, a little cockeyed hat, a smirk on his face, and a raccoon in his arms. There's a story there. Don't know what it is, but there's a story there. 
but uh, that's uh, Wilbur de Bear who uh, lost his life uh, in, uh, at Regina Trench on October 8, 1916. Um, again, every one of them's story, every one of them's uh, a life left behind. Um, with that, just a thank you to everyone who's contributed to this over the years, uh, ongoing as always, um, and um, been countless others, I'm sure I've forgotten some, but uh, students, volunteers, genealogists, librarians, um, passionate people about their remembrance and loss. Uh, just, you know, thank you to every one of them who's been part of this. Um, and this is going to be the end of the presentation here. Of course, there's, there's questions afterwards, but if anybody wants a copy of the presentation, I'm most happy to share it with you. Uh, so just let us know and we'll send you a copy of the presentation. And, uh, uh, again, it's, uh, I always say that with us, it, it, it's not our story, it's their story, and uh, um, we should remember it. Uh, back, back in the, um, maybe end on a, on a, on a, on a side uh, note, uh, um, with uh, the raising of Brock's Monument at Kingston Heights back in the 1850s, uh, William Hamilton Merritt rose on the podium, his opening words were, May this moment not be lost on the rising generation. And I think that's, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a, a throwing hand to the current generation to make sure that we remember and that we pass on those stories. So thank you for that. Wow, Matthew, oh, I know if we were here in person right now, the room would just be, we'd be all applauding you and I'm, I'm sure there would not be a dry eye in the house. So my heart is just beating right now. Thank you so much for um, reflecting on, on the many lives and, and the many losses that Mississauga uh, experienced. Um, we weren't able to gather in person on Remembrance Day this year, but I feel like having this time with you tonight just gave us that, you know, that moment to pause and, and reflect on all those who, who have served and, and paid the ultimate sacrifice. Um, um, so thank you for making that possible and so much possible for us, I mean, without this research, we wouldn't be having these conversations. We wouldn't know the stories of these these young men and their families. Um, so kudos to you for all of this and for bringing their stories to life and that that chapter in Mississauga's history um, to life for us as well tonight. Thank you. My pleasure, and thank you to the team at the museums. I mean, likewise, uh, it, it is. Uh, um, Saying it's a it's a joy to do it is the wrong phrase, but it, it, it it's it's an honor to be able to work on these things and, and to be part of that community memory. Um, and uh, uh, we all have a hand in in living and sharing the stories. So thank you for the work you guys do. Our pleasure. <laughs> we we love working with Heritage Mississauga. <laughs> 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 That's an understatement. Um, Megan, uh, I see we've got a question and so maybe we can, for those who, who can hang on and stay with us for another 10, 15 minutes, um, let's, let's ask Matthew some questions. So I'll turn it over to you, Megan. Sure. Thank you so much. I'd love to echo Elizabeth's statements. It's amazing to watch you speak. Um, I've read a lot of research, but this is the first time I've been able to to really hear you. I've, unfortunately, not in person, but but this is this is fabulous. Hearing you tell the personal stories about about these young men and their lives, it's it's amazing. Um, and uh, to kind of dovetail into a question here. Um, Matthew, what is your favorite story from this research? Oh boy! <laughs> you know, Try to prepare for questions. That was not. <laughs> that was a good one. <laughs> um, you know, in in times of darkness, sometimes you're drawn to the light. Um, and, and you know, there there's moments of humor that like I, I want to know the story of the raccoon. You know, like like yeah. That, that there's um the like some of the ones that you when names become more than just a name. Um, strike, strike you, and, and sometimes they don't come. They come much later in the process. Uh, I remember looking at um, for for a long time. We've had a name Wilford uh, Arthur Win Stanley Cook on our list, and we had his attestation paper. That was you know that was pretty much all we knew him. He was from Cooksville, and uh, and just you know we didn't know much more about him. And in the process of a completely different project, um, we made a connection with him. Um, 
And, you know, when you look at his attestation paper and you begin to, to delve into a little bit more that you have more context, you, you learn more about the individual and more about his life. He was the grandson of an emancipated slave that settled in Mississauga. Um, and, and, you know, th those, we didn't have that connection because if you look at when Sam, let me, uh, I don't know if I've got his going. I'm just going to scroll back as I'm talking here. They're there. Okay, there he is, right beside the raccoon. Uh, <laughs> Uh, this fellow with the pointy hat on on here. Uh, he, yeah, that's uh, uh, Private Wilfred Cook from Cooksville. Not the Jacob Cook family of Cooksville, but Cook is the last name. His father, his grandfather was uh, George Whitford Ross, who was an emancipated slave from Virginia. Um, and uh, both Ross and his wife, Diadamia, who settled in Mississauga in 1836, are uh, herself uh, from the Wilberforce settlement near Lincoln, Ontario, a, a daughter of an emancipated slave. Um, they're both mulatto, they have children. Their youngest daughter, Rebecca, marries a white farmer by the name of George Cook. Uh, and their son, Arthur, or, sorry, uh, Wilfred, Wilfred Arthur, uh, enlists, serves, and falls in the First World War. And, and you know, it's, a, it's the end of life. Wilfred never knew his grandfather. He was born after he, he had passed away. He lost both his parents before he was 14 years of age. Um, but you begin to tell, you know, we didn't know any of that personal side of stuff. Like, um, the only living descendant of that entire line of the family was his elder sister, Bertha, and we lose her in the records. We don't know what happens to her. Like, she's alive after the First World War, but in 1921, she disappears for us. And so we've been searching for those kind of connections as well. But, uh, I mean, there, you know, we have these stories of, you know, that aren't First World War necessarily related of, of the Ross family at Cedar Park Farm. Um, the only picture we have of any member of the family is the grandson who was a soldier in the First World War and and identified at least on his attestation attestation paper as white, um, and yet he is the direct grandson. Um, uh, it's interesting if we just look at you know the story of skin color and, and, and personal appropriation. We consider Caucasian of dark complexion, um, but uh, um, that's all it says on his form until you read more about it. You learn so I don't know if that's a favorite per se, but um, uh, it, the Every one of them is a personal life, and I find myself attached to, to a number of them. Uh, there's a picture of the soldiers in Arras in 1917, the Credit Boys in May of 1917. That's a picture I talked about, the soldiers all, you know, they're veterans now. There's a dog in the front row. Um, you know, what's the story of the dog? Uh, and, and uh, you know, did the dog survive? Did he come home? Uh, you know, those, those kind of things. I, the, the stories that we know nothing about, um, uh, they've always intrigued me and I've always been wondered, wondered by and uh, I'd, I'd like to explore further and uh, if there's ways of doing that, we'll, we'll find out in time. But uh, there's lots of stories, again, we've only scratched the surface. You know, this way, we've been doing this thing for going off in almost a decade now and I'd say we're confident in saying we've scratched the surface. <laughs> so, it's, it, it always feels like there's more out there and, and believe me when we started this uh process i think it was 2012 the research process you know we had bits and pieces but every year it feels like thousands of more records are available previously you know, they keep going back over the same stuff again and again and again and only last week did we find a picture of uh private mccordy from streetsville who died in 1920 of the spanish flu we didn't have a picture of him doesn't mean somebody somebody had a picture of him, but we didn't find it until last week. So you know, <laughs> it, it always it always is you know percolating around, and, uh, right. and uh, there's always something going on with it, and it never ends. And that's a good that's a sign of you know an honest research project. It never truly ends. I mean, there's more to be found. There's more stories to share. Right, and I'm confident that you will find so much more out <laughs> over the years. Um. Okay, I have another uh, couple questions here. Um, what was conscription like? Who did they target? The people who hadn't volunteered that were of age. <laughs> the, uh, um, you conscription uh, locally, we've only we've only uncovered. I think we've got about eight or nine individuals we found that were conscripted to service. Now, most of our research has been focused on the fallen, um, and so the those records uh 10 years ago those records were what was primarily available now we have up to 1921 which includes those that came home of course uh and so we're you know we're going to explore more and look there because i'm sure we have more conscription uh, uh stories than, than we've uncovered so far um but uh con conscription 
it was a necessary move from the establishment perspective to maintain that flow of soldiers to the front. Um, it was it was fraught with division, um, particularly between French and English Canada. But that's not to say that there were you know universal support at home either. Um, it was it was a polarizing uh, moment that you know, threatened to bring down a government and destabilize the nation uh, in terms of its war effort. Um, and you know, the Military Services Act of 1917 came into effect in January of 1918. Uh, it was a necessary move to keep those you know, that manpower up. But again, you, you you think you know the first parts of the war; these are people who are volunteering to put themselves in harm's way. So, in a sense, you look back and say, okay, well, you know that was a path you chose. Then you have a story of Arthur Gould who did not choose, uh, and yet loses his life as a process of of that that uh, uh, of, of having to serve. Uh, do not know his reasoning for not volunteering. Um, you know, I, I try to put myself in. You know, it's always dangerous when you look back and say, "What would I have done?" Um, you know, I, 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 I don't think I got a violent bone in my body, and and I don't think I have a desire to be in harm's way. Um, but you know, times are different, lives are lives are different, inspirations are different at the time, so you, you can't really judge the individual's reason behind service or not to serve. Um, and you know, people that volunteered in 1917 but were of age in 1915. Why didn't they volunteer in 1915? You know, like um, I, I don't have those answers in, in a sense. But you know, conscription did divide communities. It did divide a nation, particularly again along French and English lines. But uh, uh, it, it was not universally accepted, and, uh, and it makes you. It, we do have notes on conscription. Uh, we do know that there were challenges at home uh, to that, and so. It was a draft of sorts um, at the time, so not everybody. Who, again, you, you wonder at some why they didn't enlist and why they weren't conscripted, and we don't have those answers either. But uh, um, it certainly would have been a different point within the community. Great, right. thank you. Um, and I think we'll just do one more question here, um, but this is about your your research methodology um, as the master of research. <laughs> um, so this this kind of research project, there's just so many threads of information to kind of weave together. You're basically a detective. Um, so if, if somebody wanted to start their own research, perhaps about a family member who served, yeah. um, where would you recommend that they start uh, this research? And um, and yeah. The key, is to start, start. the key is to start with a name. <laughs> you have, uh, um, if you have a name, uh, and particularly if it's a name of a fallen. Now, it doesn't have to be fallen, particularly now since we've come forward in time and we have a record now up to 1921. Um, but if you have a name of an individual, go to Library and Archives Canada under their military uh, military research section. You can look up the various conflicts of Canadian uh, game military service. You can enter a soldier's name. Do not be shocked if there are many soldiers with a similar name. Um, you go under, so if you know they served in the First World War, look under service, First World War service files. If you, uh, Second World War, uh, you're going to have access to the Second World War dead. Um, and, uh, you know, look up the, the service record, look up the individual name. From the individual names, you should be able to find, if they served in any of the major conflicts, you should be able to find attestation papers. The attestation papers will give you a service number. Uh, under the service number, uh, unless they're an enlisted officer who do not have the service numbers, uh, but it, it, uh, the vast majority, of course, are not. So if you have the service number, you can, uh, particularly for war dead, which is where our focus is, you can go to the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. Uh, you can look up uh, your war dead material from there. Veterans, uh, Veterans Affairs also has material on war dead and the books of remembrance. Uh, and so all incredibly valuable material that you can find. Some of it is, is uh, repetitive, some of it you, you get little bits and pieces. So you get uh, the names of parents are located on this one. And uh, sometimes you can find a, a picture of a gravestone, which might give you a little bit more information, like you know, either a location of death based on the cemetery location itself, uh, circumstances of death records, which are often quite telling as to where they were killed and unfortunately the manner of the death. Um, and um, in some cases now, Library and Archives Canada are uplo uploading under the individual their service record, which can give you a lot more information on their services. But there's a number of ways to look at it. Once you begin to have that military information, then you can go look at local resources. If you're looking here in, in Mississauga or Peel or beyond, uh, like if your soldier comes from somewhere else, uh, start looking at the genealogical and cemetery records. Uh, Ancestry.ca has military records, but also census records and the like. 
So it really is a detective work and everyone, every soldier is different. Every soldier you'll find things in different places. And um, again, some of them you'll cross threads in different avenues that you hadn't thought of. Um, we've, we've also delved into our fallen uh, because they have a, a, an address for on their enlistment papers. So for those who lived in historic Mississauga, we've done our best to try to find out if their houses are still around. Um, and so that delves into property records. <laughs> if there's a property record, you might get a will. And if there's a will, it might list family members and things like that. So, you know, the, it, everything is different. There's, there's no, there's no cookie cutter, but the start again is, is finding the soldier name and finding the, um, the service number. Um, and, and that'll open up a, a window of opportunity for you. Again, our focus is largely being on the fallen. Uh, that was always our intent. This summer, we're hoping to expand that out a bit because I know the libraries have done an amazing job of collecting material and past on, on soldiers who serve. We want to explore those connections and make some of those more, you know, some, some more stories on those and pictures that we can find them and the like. And, you know, who knows, Megan, if we can literally do this again some years down the road, it might be a completely different exhibit. And, uh, and, uh, and um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's worth it. Like, it really is something we should do. Um, uh, and I don't think there's, there's, there's ever a bad time to do it. Um, so, and, and that'll expand, you know, Second World War is, is a, a anniversary are upon us as well. And looking at the fallen from there, well, it's going to be another bad with math, but about 20 years or so before we get the service records, uh, for, for, uh, for Second World War for those that did not fall. Um, so th this research will continue for a long time. Um, and, and we should do it. There's no reason not to. Yeah, we look forward to hearing more of your research, Matthew, of course. <laughs> I live vicariously through my students. <laughs> <laughs> we will too. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Matthew, again, um, just in closing, I want to thank you for all that you've shared with us tonight. Um, just giving us this opportunity to um, honor and remember Mississauga's fallen. Um, and to learn more about how we can keep their memories alive and, and carry on with uh, writing this story um, to share with future generations. So this is, uh, this work is so valuable and just monumental. Thank you for sharing a glimpse of it, a glimpse of it with us this evening. Um, and as Megan said, we will definitely be uh, having more conversations <laughs> about this because there's so much more to get into. Um, I want to also thank everyone who tuned in tonight. Um, we have some very lovely comments saying thanks to you, Matthew. Um, there's someone said, I always love hearing you speak, which is so <laughs> true. You're just the well is so deep, Matthew. <laughs> it's amazing. So thank you. Um, now we have recorded this talk, which is great. Uh, we will be sharing it on the museums of Mississauga's website. Um, hopefully, hopefully soon. Uh, we are online at mississaugaculture.ca forward slash warflowers. If you want to follow up with the museums of Mississauga about anything, you can always reach out to us at museums at mississauga.ca. Matthew, how do people get in touch with you? <laughs> um, smoke signals today. I don't know. <laughs> uh, best way is, is email history at heritagemississauga.org. Perfect. I, I think that you're going to have a lot of uh, budding historians coming out of the woodwork after so. this talk. Um, please do visit us online um, for more details on Warflowers and Our Boys. Those exhibitions are temporarily closed because Peel Region has entered the uh, level gray lockdown um, for the next 28 days. So. We are working to find a way to still make that content um, accessible to our visitors. Somehow we are going to be posting a virtual tour of Warflowers um, in the next few days. So please do visit us online, mississaugaculture.ca forward slash Warflowers, and you can visit those other um, recordings of the other speakers we had on, including Pardeep Singh Nagra of the Sikh Heritage Museum, um, Lawrence Hill in conversation with Natasha Henry, Darren Waibenga and the creators of Warflowers, uh, Vivek and Melky and Alexander Reford. So thank you to everyone who's participated and joined us tonight. Uh, we will wrap it up there. Um, just 
final note, as we are closing the event tonight, you will be taken to a short survey and we'd be grateful for any feedback you have to share with us on that survey. So thanks again, everyone for being here and we hope to see you again soon. Stay safe.